Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining me today. We've got a fun show for you, lots to talk about, and I think I have a guy on the show who enjoys talking as much as I do. (laughs) He talks to genealogists on his show, The Genealogy Guys Podcast, and that is George Morgan. Now, George and I have been emailing back and forth about the Southern California Genealogical Jamboree, which is coming up in Burbank, California, here in the at the end of June in 2009. And we're both going to be participating in something called the Son of a Blogger Summit. Although, uh, maybe it should be Sons and Daughters of a Blogger, since uh, dear Myrtle and I will be there. <laughs> anyway, uh, I told George that I thought we ought to stop emailing and jump on Skype and get a chance to talk. And so I wrangled him into coming on the show today. Along with co-producing the Genealogy Guys podcast with Drew Smith, George has authored several books, and he now writes every week for Dick Eastman's online newsletter. So we talked about that, but I also got a chance to ask George some personal questions about his life and research, and I know you'll enjoy hearing what he has to say. So that is coming up later in the show. But first, let's get down to business. Let's get to some of the new records that are coming online this week. Uh, They've been as busy as usual over at Family Search. The 1916 Canada Census is now available for free for patrons of family history centers through the center's ancestryinstitution.com login. They've also added eight new projects, including Arkansas County Marriages, Illinois County Births, and Minnesota, Montana, and Nebraska for the 1920 U.S. Census. Uh, They also have the 1930 Yucatan-Mexico Census and British Columbia Canadian Marriages. Two million new records were added to the FamilySearch record search pilot uh, recently. The completed statewide deaths index for Alabama was published. Over 1.8 million names there. That was a big one. And that collection covers deaths from 1908 all the way through 1974. Uh, Now, digital collections were added for Jamaica, Trelawney Parish, civil registration, uh, including births, and the 1892 New York Census, and a digital collection for Spain, the Avila Diocese Catholic Church Records. And other new things going on over there at FamilySearch, they've just announced that David E. Rencher has been named the Chief Genealogical Officer for Family Search. Uh, I know David's going to be speaking at the Jamboree, so I'm looking forward to hearing from him there. He'll have responsibility for helping Family Search align strategic business decisions with needs and demands of genealogy-related markets. Uh, congratulations to David Rencher. And also this week over at Ancestry, they've uh, launched something kind of unique this week. It's the German phone directories from 1915 through 1981. It's a unique collection of phone books containing the names and addresses of more than 35 million people who lived in Germany's major cities during the 20th century. Ancestry says that this is the first time that these phone books, which are held in paper form at the German National Library, have been digitized and made available online. And uh, I know they've been talking about that you can even find Albert Einstein's phone number in these phone books. So pretty interesting collection. All right. Well, now let's hear from you. And we'll do that over in the mailbox. All right. Well, I got an email this week from Mark Winter in Hickson, Tennessee. And he writes, I really enjoy your podcasts. At Christmas, I got an iPod, and I have recently been checking out various podcasts through iTunes. I saw your podcast, checked one out, and decided to download all of them in addition to subscribing. And he says, I've been listening to them in order. 
My interest in family history goes back to early 1975. I did a lot of research for about three years while in college. Then everything got boxed up and moved around with me through the years. My interest was rekindled about a year ago when my brother started asking questions about what I had done. Since he lives in Texas, I didn't want to ship it, so I scanned and PDF'd everything and sent it to him over the course of several weeks. Now, over the years, I have been updating my families, making lots of new discoveries, including the Norwegian church records, and finding and communicating with relatives. I've been able to provide a lot of information to older relatives, and they've been very interested in what I'm finding. I use my digital camera to help document my findings. It's also very helpful in copying photographs so I don't have to take the originals. That's a great tip. Uh, That works really well. He says, I I have had several relatives ask for a book of the family. Uh, In a podcast episode, do you discuss considerations of what kind of a book to produce? As I listened to your podcast number 16, I think it was, I heard you say that your husband is from Winthrop, Minnesota. I grew up in New Ulm, just south of Winthrop. My dad and my uncle still live there, so I get back home several times a year. Keep up the excellent work. I like your interviews with others who are doing family history. This electronic genealogy is so much more productive, I think, than when I first got started. The software makes it easy to spot holes where I need to focus my attention. Thanks again, Mark Winter. Well, Mark, thank you so much for writing and in sharing your genealogy experiences. I love hearing about those. And congrats on your new iPod. You're going to love it. And there's a lot of great music, great you know, podcasts and TV shows, everything that you can add to your iPod. So I am very glad that you found my podcasts and are enjoying them. And I agree with you. It is fantastic how much more quickly we can make progress in our research with all the new technology. I mean, compared to back in the old days, it's amazing. And, and it's so fascinating to realize it's only a fraction of what's available, but it has made that fraction so much more accessible, hasn't it? Now, you asked about family history books. In the Genealogy Gems podcast, episode number 13, I cover publishing family history books using Kodak Gallery. And I think these books are great for creating something that's beautiful and easy to read to share with particularly non-genealogist relatives. They love these books because they can usually sit down and read them in one sitting, and they're packed full of wonderful old family photos. But of course, there are many different approaches that you can take when publishing a family history book, and um, the Kodak books are really just one approach. But I think they're a great way to start. So stay tuned, though. I plan on covering publishing uh, much more in depth in the future, probably on the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast. So stay tuned for that. And of course, regarding Winthrop, Minnesota, my husband's maternal line is actually the ones from Winthrop. And it's funny because the more I research Winthrop, the more I come to feel that uh, I know that community and that area. So I can't wait until we can finally make a trip back and, and see everything firsthand. That's quite a coincidence that you grew up in New Ulm because Winthrop is a small little town <laughs> uh, in, in Minnesota. So anyway, thanks so much for writing and uh, for sharing your experiences and also for passing along those questions. Hopefully that, that'll help other people as well. And if you want to share genealogy stories or you have a question, do like Mark did and just drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Profile America, Tuesday, May 12th. It seems like a simple device, that row of numbers on your car's speedometer, that measures how far it has traveled since it was new or how many miles you've covered on a trip. Called an odometer, it was used for the first time on this day in 1847 by a Mormon pioneer named William Clayton. Up until his invention, elapsed miles were calculated by tediously counting the revolutions of a rag tied to the spoke of one of the wagon's wheels. Today, most of us regularly cover a lot of miles. The average car in the U.S. travels more than 12,000 miles a year, almost 1,500 miles more than the average van, pickup, or SUV. The average truck, on the other hand, sees more than 27,000 miles of use annually. Profile America is beginning its 13th year as a public service of the U.S. Census Bureau. 
as I mentioned in previous episodes, I am really looking forward to heading down to Burbank, California in June to attend the Southern California Genealogical Jamboree. And while there, uh, not only will I be teaching some of my beginning and advanced Google classes, but I'm going to be participating in an event that is unique to the Jamboree, and that is the Son of a Blogger Summit, which will be kind of a panel discussion with some of us who feed the internet with genealogical information and comment. And that's whether in writing uh, on a blog or in audio, like through a podcast. Well, my next guest is someone who will be on that panel. Every week, he co-produces the Genealogy Guys podcast, and that's the genealogy guy himself, George Morgan. Hi, George, and welcome to my little neck of the woods. Hi, Lisa. It's good to be here. Oh, great to have you. Well, you know, since you live on the East Coast and I live on the West Coast, there aren't a lot of opportunities for us to uh, meet up and visit. So I'm really excited that we're going to get that chance at the Jamboree. It's nice. It's nice to get together and share ideas and collaborate. Exactly. Well, I figured the Jamboree is going to be a very whirlwind weekend. So I'm really glad that you could join me uh, today so we could have a chance to chat before then and uh, let the audience listen in on that, too. (laughs) Great. Um, Well, there are so many things I want to talk to you about. Um, I want to talk to you about the Genealogy Guys podcast, how it came about. And I know that you've been busy working on books. So we want to talk about some of your books. And, um, and of course, the Jamboree. But I also want to have a chance to really kind of get to know you better. And I want to ask you about kind of what sparked your interest in genealogy and what keeps you going on it. And, um, and what it kind of has meant to you personally. But first of all, let's st- dive right into genealogy, guys. Tell us about how in the world that came about. Well, Drew Smith and I have uh, known each other for, I guess, about 15 years, and we decided uh, we've done a lot of research together. We've done uh, trips. We've, we're members of, of many of the same societies, and we decided that uh, there needed to be a a regularly scheduled podcast out there. There were other people who had done them occasionally. Uh, Dear Myrtle had done one. Dick Eastman uh, occasionally does one. But we decided that there really was a, a need for a general genealogy podcast. And so we educated ourselves a little bit. We downloaded uh, some software, started out with just a little tabletop mic. We've since expanded to a small mixer and a, and a pair of, uh, of really nice microphones. And uh, we've, just, uh, we've been doing this since September of 2006, I guess it is. We've been, we're up to our 170th episode or 171. So we've, we've been in business with this for quite a while. You have. And we're really excited about it, too. Um, we've gotten uh, responses back from listeners all over the world, literally. Um, we've had soldiers from Kuwait, people in Qatar, um, uh, North America, South America, uh, Europe, the Philippines, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. We literally have, uh, from what we can tell on a regular basis, we, we regularly have somewhere between uh, three and a half and four thousand people uh, downloading the podcast every week. Exactly, and I and aren't you finding that? As I know, I am that you know every week that goes by, more and more people are are kind of taking the plunge and jumping into iTunes and jumping in online. And um, podcasting is still fairly new to a lot of people, but it certainly is growing every week. And it's it's fun because I think it's a little more intimate than just reading the words. You're really hearing the voices. I, I hear from um, our listeners on a regular basis. They say, oh, it's so nice to be able to to listen to something while I'm doing something else. Um, yeah. Whether it's doing their exercise at the gym or, uh, or ironing or doing housework or jogging or whatever. And I think... I think that that's really exciting, too. It's nice to be able to multitask like that. Um, we did have one fellow who sent us an email not too long ago uh, who said uh, he was listening to the podcast in the gym, and uh, it turned out that, that he was yelling uh, about a, a subject that, was, uh, that he was excited about. And <laughs> people in the gym were looking at him very strangely. <laughs> As you were talking to him in, the, in his ears, and nobody else knew what the, you were saying, but they heard him loud and clear, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, and 
and certainly podcasting is a favorite medium of mine, but you also reach people in a lot of other ways. I know that you you write books. You have written the uh, official guide to Ancestry.com. And I saw that you just did the uh, second revision of How to Do Everything Genealogy. Tell us a little bit about some of the books you've got out there and what you're trying to accomplish with those. Well, I've uh, I've done eight books over the years. Um, the uh, the first and second editions of the official guide to Ancestry.com came very quickly on one another. Um, there were, and, and we knew there were changes coming after the first edition, um, but the book hadn't been out more than two months, and uh, Ancestry contacted me again and said, would you would be willing to do an edition uh, with uh, some new features? And so we did that. And of course, Everything changes, and Ancestry keeps growing and growing, and they add new facilities, uh, and the, the book is, is, almost, uh, is almost complete and almost accurate when it comes out. But uh, that's, been a, that's been a great challenge. The, the other book is uh, How to Do Everything Genealogy, and it's part of McGraw-Hill Osborne's uh, series of how to do everything books, and they've done things on uh, how to do everything with your scanner, with uh, your digital camera, with your uh, video camera, with uh, eBay. They've just done a whole lot of these, and they contacted me about four and a half years ago and asked me if I'd be willing to write a book about genealogy. They were trying to expand outside their normal range of tech topics. And I, I certainly agreed, and I poured uh, my life in genealogy, I poured that out into, uh, uh, into that book. And it, it really it was, I think, the, the single book I was proudest of up till that time. And then they came back to me uh, last, uh, last summer and asked me if I'd be willing to do a second edition of the book. And I jumped at the chance. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. But the new book, uh, How to Do Everything Genealogy, just came out a few weeks ago. And it, it wasn't just a question, Lisa, of going through and updating uh, web addresses. Uh, there, was, there was a bunch of new content involved there, too. I had the chance to, to redo uh, a lot of the chapters with, um, with new contact information, with new... Uh, new resources. So much in in the space of four years had has come up online, as you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it gave me the opportunity to uh, give exposure to uh, social networks. In addition, I was uh, it gave me a chance to add a chapter about uh, genetic genealogy research, uh, which is obviously a very big uh, tool in uh, genealogist toolkits these days. Mm-hmm. So, so the book gave me the chance to to do a lot of updates there and to come up with with uh, a new opus, and I'm I'm really very very pleased with it. Well, you know it, that really brings up the difference between books where you have um, information that is kind of a moment in time, and then you have podcasting where you have the opportunity to update and revise every single week. Do you have a preference between the two and how you're putting out information? Well, um, I I like the fact that uh, the podcast is is an immediate means of of getting fresh information out there. It's not unlike being part of a a genealogical society and publishing a monthly newsletter versus uh, a a quarterly uh, journal of some sort. But I, I like the podcast because it gives us a chance to, to lay the news out while at the same time dealing with listener email and, and other subjects coming along. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's kind of a nice mix, you know, because you can have the reference guide on your desk and paper, but you can get all the updates real time online. So that's pretty cool. And, and talking about the dissemination of information. That's really what the Blogger Summit is all about. It's going to be some of us getting together and talking about how we do that. Um, It's changing every day. And I know that you've been kind of coordinating, you put together a little syllabus on it. Tell us more about who's going to be there and what we're going to be doing. 
Well, uh, to tell you the truth, what, what we did last year for the first time uh, at Jamboree, there was a blogger summit, and there were a bunch of us there doing all kinds of, of different things, uh, blogging, podcasts, uh, video casts, and, uh, and, and all kinds of, of communication. Um, and one of the fun things there was, as we were doing the Blogger Summit, there was a blogger in the audience who took a photograph of the, of the panel and uploaded it to their blog site and then asked uh, Leland Meitzler, who was uh, the moderator last year, to pull that site up. And sure enough, we're sitting in, in the Blogger Summit, and there's a photograph of us in the Blogger Summit. So you talk about immediate gratification. That was wonderful. Oh, yeah, and real-time information. <laughs> it really was. And really, podcasting is a form of blogging. It's just audio blogging, right? A, a blog can be anything. It can be a, um, a an account of your personal uh, genealogical research. It can be tips of the day. It can be um, anything you want it to be. Uh, Son of Blogger this year, uh, we will be at uh, the... Uh, Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree uh, for, for their uh, dates of the 26th, 27th, and 28th of June in Burbank. Our Son of Blogger Summit will be held on Saturday morning, the 27th of June. And what we've what we've done is we've come up with a a, a group here of of I think really excellent bloggers. Um, uh, I get to coordinate it this year, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, we have the Ins Ancestry Insider, who writes a blog for Ancestry.com. The mystery man. Uh, he is a mystery man. <laughs> and, try, um, and uh, he's very successful at hiding his identity. Yes. And, uh, and Lisa, you will be there. We're looking forward to having you on the, uh, the panel. Dick Eastman, uh, the prolific author of Eastman's online genealogy newsletter, um, he will be there. Leland Meitzler, and Leland has been involved in, in many areas of genealogy and publishing stan uh, standards, the uh, evidence uh, genealogical helper for a while, and, uh, and he's very involved with blogging, and he'll be there. And Shelley uh, Dardashti, uh, who is responsible for the Jewish uh, blog, uh, Tracing the T Tribe. And right. she'll be coming in. Uh, she lives in Tel Aviv, Israel. So we're looking forward to having her here. She was on the, on the panel last year and very, uh, very well received. The Blogger Summit is really going to be a neat opportunity to get a chance to see and meet some of these people in person. It, it's funny, you know, everybody's involved now in Facebook and Twitter, and I, I see names and I see faces, and it's so fun to go to conferences. And you walk up and you see a face you recognize, and you just feel like you've known each other forever. It just really opens up the doors to um, get a chance to, to get to know each other more personally, doesn't it? It sure does. We have three more participants on that uh, uh, on that panel. One of whom you just uh, had on your uh, podcast recently, and that's Steve Danko. Right. And uh, I love Steve Danko's blog. It's it's perhaps the uh, the best blog uh, of personal research that I've ever seen. And he's very much involved in in researching his Polish ancestors. Um, and so. Uh, he's going to be there. Uh, Craig Manson will will be with us. He does a blog called Genia Bloggy and um, has had a very interesting uh, life. He lives in Car Carmichael, California, and he'll be with us. And then, last but not least, is uh, Pat Richley, whose uh, whose nom de plume is Dear Myrtle. And I think just about everybody in the genealogy community uh, knows Dear Myrtle. She's been She's been uh, writing columns and uh, uh, articles and uh, been blogging, and she's been online since about 1985. So um, uh, the young lady will be with us, and I'm looking forward to that. Exactly. One of the early pioneers. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. We're going to pretty much field whatever questions come along. I mean, the, as a group, the bloggers will be, uh, the panelists will be talking about uh, their own blogs and what's involved in putting one together and, and really kind of discussing the, the state of the, 
of the blogging community these days. Uh, what are some of the ethical issues involved? And, and uh, giving people tips on how to start a blog. It's really very easy. And uh, some pros and cons on uh, what you want to do on your blog. So, so that's the focus of that. Speaking of blogs, you can get lots and lots of information about the upcoming summit as well as the entire conference on the Southern California Genealogical Jamboree blog. <laughs> and I will have a link for that to, in the show notes for this episode so that you can link and go directly there and read more about the summit as well as all the classes and some of the great speakers that they've got coming. I was just in that blog this morning looking at... Uh, the section that they're maintaining there, meet the speakers. So they're doing some biographical things on um, on speakers and discussing what they the, what they'll be discussing. Yeah, it's really nice because you can kind of do some of your research before you get there and have some of your classes picked out and some of the key places you want to make sure you hit because it seems like the weekend just blows by so quickly that it's nice to go in with a little bit of a game plan, isn't it? It it, it really does. Uh, that's the way to really get the most out of the out of the conference. Um, the, other, the other things that I recommend to people uh, who are first-time ac- attendees for a conference like this uh, are, you know, talk to people. Don't just, you know, huddle up in a corner in a, in a room. Introduce yourself and, and uh, get to know people and, and share ideas. I mean, after all, the word is confer uh, in conference, so let's do that. And then the other thing I, I really recommend is to get into the vendor hall, the vendor area, and start talking to the vendors, the booksellers, the uh, professional researchers, everybody you, you can possibly talk to. Ask them what they recommend for the type of research you're doing. Exactly. It's great advice because how often do you get a chance to talk with them one-on-one? <laughs> and just because they don't have a particular book about a particular area that you're doing research in does not mean that uh, that they don't know something about it. Uh, they certainly don't bring their entire inventory from their from their stores or, or wherever. Um, they they bring what they think is a representative uh, example, but they also know that uh, uh, in order to stay in business, they have to know a lot about genealogy and. Uh, and uh, different areas and different aspects of the research. So I, I like to work the vendor hall as well. And I've made some, uh, some good friends over the years and, and some new acquaintances. And uh, I, I always think that uh, mining the vendor's minds makes a lot of sense. Well, before I let you go, I wanted to uh, talk with you just about some of your personal experiences with your research. First question was, what sparked your interest originally in genealogy? Where did that start for you? My grandmother, Morgan, decided when I was 10 years old, that, and she was 89, she decided that I was the last chance to get somebody interested in uh, knowing about our Revolutionary War uh, patriot ancestors. Mm. And uh, she sat me down, and uh, we, uh, uh, at a drop leaf table that I still have in my possession, and that dates from the 1740s, that table. Wow. And we sat, we sat down with a roll of uh, brown parcel paper and rulers and pencils and uh, and she started gr- drawing a family tree and she'd send me to uh, uh, to get uh, her Bible or uh, my grandfather's Bible or or some other documents and she actually had uh, she actually had two cardboard boxes in a drawer of a of a large chiffre robe um, and uh, in those boxes were deeds and wills and old Bibles going back into the 1700s. In fact, there there was a Bible in there that was uh, printed in uh, uh, Edinburgh, not Edinburgh, but Edinburgh, Scotland, in 1693. Wow. And uh, that had obviously come over on a ship with someone, and we... Uh, we sat there and we transcribed all kinds of information from Bibles and documents, but my grandmother recited from, from memory uh, how this person was related, where they fell in the family and all that. I still have that, uh, uh, that, that rather crumbling uh, piece of parcel paper, but 
um, she got me started, and my life has has not been the same since. It it turned me on to history and geography, um, and and it's just never stopped. Now, how old were you when that happened? Ten. Ten years old. That's the perfect age, I think. That's that was forty six years ago. <laughs> Which I bet you she's very very pleased looking down, knowing that you have taken it so far and that you've continued it. That that her legacy is not going to be lost. That's so important. It, it it's been interesting, and and all of those all of those documents in those little cardboard boxes. Uh, I've carried those around all these years, so they they are they are still taken care of. Absolutely. So. After all these years, what keeps you going in your research? I'm sure there are times where there's, you kind of come to a, a pause and you think, hmm, I've, I've got a lot here now. And then other times where you just want to hit your head against the wall because there's a big brick wall there. What keeps you motivated and keeps George Morgan going on his own research? Lisa, what keeps me going is the thrill of the chase. Yeah. I, I love the research. Um, I love the, the continual uh, investigation into history and geography and social context. Uh, that, to me, is, is fascinating. But beyond that, I love the interaction with other people. I like to, I like to help other people with their research. And you know and I know at conferences, people will come up to us as speakers, uh, some of them with a, a little trepidation thinking, you know, they can't talk to us. But uh, my goodness, I love talking to people. And when they, when they show up and start saying, well, I have, this, I have this brick wall. Do you have any suggestions? And I'll ask questions. Where, when, what have you found so far? And those questions make me think outside my own research box. Yeah. And often if I don't have uh, an answer, I'll give them a business card and get their their telephone number and or email address and I'll go back and do some research and get back to them uh, at least with some suggestions. And I think the podcast is is a nice natural extension of that too, Lisa. Um mm-hmm. Drew and I get uh, a lot of email from our listeners, and they they pose some very interesting questions for us. and And they have brick walls, they have research puzzles that uh, that we've never seen before, and it makes us think outside the box. Now, uh, I'll tell you, Drew is a, a tremendous researcher. He's a librarian's librarian. <laughs> Um, and that's why he's perfect in his job at the University of South Florida Library. But um, he loves to, to take a problem and go looking. And he'll pick questions. People say, I can't find this. He'll pull up a census record or he'll look for a naturalization record or, or whatever. And, and he'll respond to them. So, so he does a lot of that on a number of mailing lists. But uh, I like to do that as well. And, but I think doing it on the podcast reaches a whole lot more uh, people, uh, other people who don't have those research problems um, or haven't yet encountered them, at least they get a chance to hear what other people are going through, and maybe that methodology, maybe that different record type will spur them on to make some progress in their own research. I think that's very well said because I know that mirrors my experience. It's, it's such a amazing opportunity to get to share and reach on such an extended level. I mean, five or 10 years ago, it just wasn't as feasible. And now we're sitting in our home office and reaching thousands of people around the world. And it's it's such an honor and a privilege to just be a little part of their life, isn't it? And, and know that maybe we can give them a little gem here and there that helps them preserve their own family legacy. It's just an amazing experience. I agree. And I think we we bear a heavy responsibility too. Yeah. So that uh, that uh, people listen to us, they trust us, they bring us their problems, and they're looking for honest, straightforward answers back. And uh, I, I personally feel that that I would never give a wrong piece of information. I would never blow off um, somebody's problem without doing some real research. And if I can't find the answer, I'm honest about it, and, and I'll say I can't find it. Sometimes on the podcast, uh, we do run across questions like that, 
and uh, we ask our listeners, do you have any information on this? Um, have you had any experience? And very often we will get uh, responses in the form of email from other listeners. The whole idea of blogging and podcasting is the community that gets, that gets generated. I think it's so neat that, that you tap into it. I know I do. My listeners come up with all kinds of brainstorms. It's just fantastic. And, and that brings me, though, you know, aside from reaching the, the worldwide audience, from, you know, writing the books, doing all the, the fun and exciting things that you're doing, I know that all of us kind of experience something on a very personal level when it comes to our family research, what it what it means to us, what we learn from it, you know. And I'm really interested to know what things have come to you over the years as you've been working on your family history. How has it changed you maybe your perspectives really what has it meant to you personally to to invest that kind of time into your research and what does the research give you back well i think the research has uh, given me a whole lot of, um, it's certainly given me an education it's forced me to to reach beyond the uh the schoolroom education that i've received over the years but it, it's lifelong learning for one thing but on a personal note, uh, it's given me a greater sense of family and understanding than I ever would have had. Um, I was I was the last grandchild uh, in in my family on on both sides, and there was twelve years difference between my older brother and myself. Mm. And so I, w- I came along rather late. Uh, as I said, when, when I was 10, my uh, grandmother Morgan was 89. And she only lived about three more years, three and a half more years after that. But uh, I've learned more about uh, uh, many, of, many of the family members, let's say my, my grandmother's siblings. I've learned more about uh, the family units, where they were, what the people did that uh, coming along so late, I never would have learned. Mm-hmm. also learned a lot of family secrets. Um, things that weren't talked about uh, have, have found their way uh, to the light. I've learned uh, that uh, I have cousins, first and second cousins, who are, who are very interested in the family, but they sure don't want to do the research. <laughs> and I've also learned that, uh, that, that they treat me like the... Uh, uh, like the family archive, if they've got something that they don't want, they'll send it to me. Don't you love that? I love being the family archive. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the expression "the accidental archive" is certainly holding yeah. true. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I, I, I keep saying I need uh, I need to take out a home equity loan to add on the genealogy wing. <laughs> store all this stuff. Exactly. Um, George, it's been such a pleasure getting a chance to talk to you, not only about your professional endeavors, but also about your personal um, experience with research. I think that's one of the things that I always hope to bring more to the audience, because sometimes when folks consider doing family history, they just look at it from the research standpoint and, oh, I wonder what I can find. But they sometimes underestimate what it can mean to us on a personal level. And I really appreciate you sharing that with them so that they just have a sense of, of what the the joys of it that may come about, uh, particularly like in your case, you're the caboose of the family. <laughs> and, you know, when you pull up the tail end, sometimes you miss out. So I just think that's wonderful that that, that has brought you and connected you back in a little closer than the years did. Well, I'm looking forward to the Blogger Summit. I'm looking forward to Jamboree out in uh, Burbank. Uh, To my way of thinking, Jamboree is absolutely one of the greatest conferences I've ever been to. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it again this year. And uh, I certainly hope that uh, the people who can attend will. And uh, when they do... Uh, stop us, talk, come to the Son of Blogger session, and uh, um, uh, the genealogy guys are actually sharing a booth with Dick Eastman in the vendor hall. So we, sh- we hope you'll stop by and talk to us then. Fantastic. Well, George, thanks so much. We'll have a link to the Genealogy Guys podcast on the webpage, and uh, I will look forward to seeing you at Jamboree and talking and hearing from you throughout the blogosphere. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Lisa.
Would you like to boost your genealogy research and break through those brick walls? Well, here's your answer. Become a Genealogy Gems Premium Member. You'll get two extra members-only episodes every month packed with great tips that you can use right away and instructional videos walking you through the best internet tools step-by-step. In the current series called Google, A Goldmine of Genealogy Gems, I'll show you how to get the most out of Google. If you enjoy the Genealogy Gems podcast, then you're going to love being a Genealogy Gems premium member. This is Tim Cox. I'm a premium member, and I have been for a while. just wanted to call and let you know that I really enjoyed being a premium member, and one of the perks I like about it is the videos. I learned how to build my own genealogy dashboard. The videos were called Google, a goldmine of genealogy gems, and because I made that dashboard, I'm able to monitor all the blogs and the websites that interest me, and I was able to create tabs So each tab has different topics and just go to each one I want. This is like the best thing since sliced bread. So Lisa, thank you for what you're doing and I really do enjoy your podcast. To become a premium member, go to my website at genealogygems.tv and click the join today button. And by entering the special coupon code SAVE20, that's S-A-V-E-2-0, you'll get 20% off the annual membership. Genealogy Gems Premium Membership. It's where you belong. Profile America, Sunday, May 10th. Today is Mother's Day, one of the nation's most honored national observances. The idea started in 1908 with Anna Jarvis of West Virginia to honor her recently departed mother, who had voiced the hope that someday there would be a day to commemorate all mothers. By 1911, every state observed Mother's Day, and in 1914, Congress made it a national event. There are nearly 83 million mothers across the U.S. Each year, just over 4 million women have babies. Of these, 435,000 are teenagers, 15 to 19, and at the other end of the age scale, more than 112,000 are 40 or older. The average age of women giving birth for the first time is 25. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Well, that wraps up this episode. Now, since this episode is being published on Mother's Day in 2009, I want to wish all of you moms out there a wonderful, relaxing day with your family. And I want to send a personal Mother's Day greeting to my mom, Ellen Cohen. Uh, You met her on the show quite a while back when she shared her expertise on handling heritage quilts with us. Well, my mom is the most creative person I know. And when she does something, she does it beautifully and with such care and expertise that you always know that her heart is in it. And I've tried to learn that lesson from her, that uh, things worth doing are worth doing well. And I'm really lucky because every time I take a step in my life, um, my mom is there cheering me on. Even if I'm not sure what I'm doing, you know, she just radiates pure confidence in me and everything that I do. It's pretty nice to know that there's that kind of support behind me. So, Mom, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for all your cheerleading and your um, belief in me. And I love you very, very much. Happy Mother's Day. Well, thanks for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.